Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, yeah, there are more. <coughs> Uh, it's a great honor to be amongst the uh, list of finalists for the directorship position. I have uh, been here at the Weissman Center for many years and have loved uh, being here. And um, I wanted to begin by uh, telling you, as Brad mentioned, a little bit about my training and background. Uh, when I was a PhD student studying developmental psychology, I focused on uh, binaural and spatial hearing, which I'll tell you about today, how we're able to localize sound, especially in reverberant environments. And, I became very interested in how the brain was using those stimuli, and so I convinced um, a neurophysiologist uh, by the name of Tom Yin to let a developmental psychologist into his lab, and he trained me on how to do single cell recordings in the brainstem of animals using the same stimuli that we had used uh, with our uh, human subjects. Um, and then I was very fortunate to spend seven years uh, in the Boston area where I could continue to do both the perception, psychophysics, and the physiology, and was also embedded in a biomedical engineering department, learning about modeling uh, of the auditory system. And that's when I began to get involved in uh, clinically relevant research. So um, one of the most exciting things about coming here to the uh, University of Wisconsin was that I was able to be both in a uh, the department that trains clinicians and basic scientists, and to be an investigator here at the Weissman Center. And I've been very fortunate to be able to recruit and train PhD students and postdoctoral fellows who come from a number of different areas. And it really leads to a beautiful intersectionality um, in our lab. And in fact, um, the lab comprises of people who come from uh, these diverse areas and they bring different expertise and end up collaborating on all of these topics, everybody bringing what they know and learning from one another and helping each other out. And so we have folks who are neuroscientists, basic scientists and engineers, clinicians, psychologists, and we also have mathematicians and physicists in the lab. So I'll begin by telling you about my research. And at the crux of this research program is why do we have two ears? How is it that having two ears helps us with everyday listening situations? One of the most important tasks we have to accomplish is to know where sounds are coming from. So if you're crossing a busy street, or if you're in a noisy room and someone calls your name, how do you direct your attention to that person? In addition to sound localization, and related to that is what we fondly call the cocktail party effect, which uh, we also think about in the classroom situation for children. And the question is, how can you listen to what one person is saying and ignore this cacophony of noise, environmental sounds, and other people who are in the room uh, competing uh, with the original sound source? Patients also report to us that when they're able to listen with both ears, and I think normal hearing people experience the same thing, that when you're able to listen with both ears, there's a reduction in cognitive load. It's really hard to find ways to actually measure that. And I'll talk to you about some measures we're making in the lab with pupil dilation using an eye tracker. But this is a really important part of understanding how localization, separating speech from noise, uh, really impacts our day-to-day functioning. So I'll tell you today about studies in uh, toddlers, uh, children and adults who are normal hearing and also in people who are deaf and who use cochlear implants and that's the clinical and translational part of the work that we do. So what are cochlear implants? Well let's first think about the normal acoustic system and uh, the organ of hearing, the cochlea, is lined with this beautiful array of tens of thousands of hair cells. And these tens of thousands of hair cells actually are distributed along a map of frequency, a tonotopic axis from low all the way to high frequencies, sort of like distribution on a piano keyboard. If these hair cells cease to function, uh, people experience sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss is permanent. Today there are no medical viable clinical ways to restore hearing, to rebuild hair cells. And the causes of damage come from many factors. I list just a few here, genetic, autotoxic, noise exposure, and many unknown factors. So in lieu of regeneration or genetic uh, treatments, one of the common treatments for deafness is to provide a cochlear implant. And what the cochlear implant attempts to do is to replace what the beautiful, very intricate acoustic system does 
and to bypass all of that, the external, middle ear, and inner ear, and to provide a set of electrodes that go directly into the cochlea. We have an external microphone speech processor and then transmission through the skin to uh, a receiver that's implanted in the bone. And then we basically take those tens of thousands of hair cells and try to use a very limited number of channels, between 12 and 22 channels, to give hearing back to people. So the cochlear implant was uh, FDA approved in the 1980s, and there's been both progress, and I'll talk to you today about limitations. This is the first medical device to restore a hearing sense, and I think of it as a modern engineering feat, because now <coughs> over half a million people benefit from the use of cochlear implants. And one of the reasons why it's become so common is that 90% of infants and children who are deaf grow up in families where the parents hear and want to communicate using oral spoken language. And also many adults who use oral spoken language become deaf and want to be able to regain access to sound. So cochlear implants actually have both successes and limitations. And I show you this graph here published uh, by close colleagues a number of years ago in JAMA showing the trajectory of language acquisition, both comprehension and expression scores. This is the age at which they tested the children, and here you see the scores. These are the curves for normal hearing children, and you can see that the children with cochlear implants have emergence of language skills, but they're delayed relative to children with normal hearing, especially if they're older as they got their cochlear implants. So there's a really huge impact of the age of implantation, and there's a gap in performance between normal hearing and implanted children. We worry about this gap, especially when children are mainstreamed in complex, noisy environments and when they have to compete for success with children who are typically developing and normally hearing. And with one implant, we know that it's hard to localize, to hear speech and noise, and there's also an issue of social isolation and fatigue. So, one of the uh, attempts to resolve uh, some of these issues is uh, to provide people with two cochlear implants to try and restore bilateral or binaural hearing. Uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, um, there were some clinical trials sponsored both by the NIH and by industry or the manufacturers of the implants to try and assess the extent to which there are benefits from giving people two implants. And there are reasons why you might not want to. First of all, the cost is very high. They cost about $60,000 per ear. And then some people worry about whether implanting both ears means that you're not leaving an opportunity for future treatments with stem cells or genetics or other better technologies. But the floodgates began to open as parents really wanted this to happen for their children, and the industry really went wild. Um, and our job as researchers was to really try and document, understand, study, and look at what these kinds of outcomes look like. So we actually bring children uh, and adults to the Weissman Center from all over the country. We have some local patients, but many of them travel from all over, and they stay in town for days at a time as we put them through a pretty rigorous set of experiments. And I'll tell you about some of what we've learned um, in our studies. Oh, I actually wanted to also tell you, um, how do I go up? Um, I wanted to tell you about that picture of the family I just showed you. Uh, sorry, how do I go up? There, okay. So this family is really interesting because both parents were born deaf and they learned uh, a little bit of spoken language, but they also communicated uh, with uh, sign language. But they did not want their children, who were both also born congenitally deaf, to grow up that same way. And they were huge advocates for their children to be implanted in both ears by the age of 12 months. And they're very unique and different because we're also seeing deaf parents who are pushing uh, for implantation in their children. And in fact, uh, each of these parents got an implant themselves so they could know what it is that their children are going through. Okay, so uh, the goals and the ideal outcomes related to cochlear implantation in both ears are to close the gap relative to normal hearing listeners in these areas, improving speech understanding, improving sound localization, and reducing cognitive load. So I'd like to tell you about some of the approaches that we've taken in the lab and give you some highlights from some of our experiments. 
What we try to do in the laboratory setting in small soundproof booths is to simulate a realistic listening situation. So we place loudspeakers in various locations around the room and we bring sounds that they might hear in everyday listening environments while trying to keep everything under tight experimental control. For children, we devise these computer-based listening games where we, they hear sounds and they have to point to pictures on the computer screen that match the sounds that they hear. And we're trying to measure whether there are benefits when using two ears compared with one, or also when we spatially separate target speech from background maskers. And this work was motivated by a lot of work that was done over the years in normal hearing listeners and hearing aid users showing the benefits of having uh, access to sounds in both ears. So let's think a little bit about simulating this cocktail party or classroom situation. What are some of the benefits that we might see uh, and how do we measure them? So we might place uh, a person in the room and present target speech from in front and also the masking sounds from in front. And then we either test them with both ears on or it's very easy to create deafness in one ear. You just have to turn off that cochlear implant. We can also um, play around with configurations that simulate cartel party listening by comparing performance on this condition where target and maskers are in the same location, which is pretty hard, and conditions in which the maskers are positioned in other places uh, relative to the head in the room. And so what we're looking for are at the advantage of spatial separation. Can they use this advantage, which is what binaural hearing gives you? So we measure performance when they're co-located or separated and look at the differences. I should also mention that versions of this test were patented by Wharf um, some years ago, and we've worked on uh, various licensing agreements with uh, clinics around the world, which uh, we're pretty excited about. So over the years, um, using these sort of configurations, I want to highlight a few findings. The first one is that children and adults hear speech and noise better when they're using two devices compared with one. However, in general, performance is not the same as it is in normal hearing listeners. There's also an interesting effect of the duration of deafness and the age of implantation. We're starting to see that younger implanted children might show performance more on par with normal hearing peers. And um, both adults and patients, as I meant, as uh, parents of children, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, provide us with these subjective reports that they don't want to leave the house in the morning without both of their ears. And how we document that, I'll talk to you uh, a little bit more about in a few minutes. <coughs> so, in terms of sound localization, we also have to engage the children in these listening games. And one example is where we vary uh, the location of sounds and look at the smallest differences that they can discriminate. And here I'm showing you data where um, smaller numbers means better performance because they're able to discriminate smaller differences in locations. Normal hearing children are rock stars at this, and in fact, they're very good at this within the first year of life. These are data from two studies in which when they listen with two implants, you can see that they're actually better than when they listen with one cochlear implant. This is the benefit of bilateral implantation. However, there's a gap in performance, and there's also much more variability in these children who have bilateral implants. And in fact, it takes time for them to learn how to do this. I remember testing one of my first children and asking her, tell me where the sound is coming from. And she just looked up at me very innocently and said, I don't hear sound is coming from places. But two years later, she came back to the lab again and again, and about two years later, she had this aha moment, I understand what you're asking me to do now. Um, now, when we bring adults into the lab, the tasks are much more complicated, um, but essentially we see some of the similar effects. These are localization uh, root mean square error data, so low numbers is better performance. These are data from a group of adults with two implants, and this is what normal hearing subjects look like. Now, um, here I uh, also want to point out that if we take off one implant, they kind of operate a chance. So there's a nice bilateral advantage, but a gap in performance. And where does that gap come from? When they're listening with sort of standard acoustic stimuli, they're very good. But if we take the same normal hearing subjects and we use computer simulations of cochlear implants to try and degrade the signal to mimic what's going on in these devices, 
we can bring their performance back up or worse and similar to the bilateral uh, users. So we're starting to understand what are some of the limitations and what are the missing mechanisms by doing these studies with simulations. So why are cochlear implant users not as good um, at these tasks as normal hearing peers? Well, we're trying to replace a beautiful acoustic system with a pretty coarse electric system. And we have to worry about effects of neuropathology due to deafness and deprivation. And um, we're also worrying about the fact that the engineering of the two cochlear implants doesn't provide binaural hearing per se. It doesn't really synchronize the devices. What is actually binaural hearing? Well, when we localize sound in the horizontal plane, we get these beautiful cues that reach the head with fidelity. If a sound, for example, is coming from the right, it's going to reach the right ear before the left ear, and the differences are in on the order of millions of a second, and every location brings a different cue to the ears. Um, and this is not existing in cochlear implants today because they're not synchronized in any uh, obligatory fashion from the engineering point of view. We also have level differences, which is that the sound is louder in the right than in the left ear. These cues are maintained to some extent in the cochlear implants. Now, if we look at the uh, auditory pathway, and I don't expect you to uh, memorize this or know the details, but I want to point <laughs> out that two synapses away from the cochlea, this is the cochlea, two synapses into the brainstem, we have parallel pathways that process time and level. And these are essential for what we need in order to localize and segregate speech from noise. And if you don't give these cues early on in life, there's evidence from animal studies that development is crucial and that deafness and deprivation lead to degradation in those circuits. And some of what they're finding in animal models is pretty similar to what we're finding in our human uh, studies. And I also have to point out that timing cues are superior and the synchrony to us is a huge part of developing new engineering strategies. So children and adults are basically fitted with independent devices in the two ears and we want to be able to restore binaural hearing to improve their performance. So how do we do that? Well, we can't do it with clinical processors, but we can partner with manufacturers who give us research interfaces. And what we can do is take off the external clinical processor and hook up patients to, clinical, uh, to um, research interfaces you can see pictures of adults and a child here who are using these interfaces. And now we can engineer signal processing strategies that attempt to restore binaural hearing. So we can pick electrodes in the two cochlea, as many pairs as we want, and bring back binaural hearing. The question is, can we really do that and will it have clinical validation? So here's um, an example of the kind of experiment we might do where a listener would hear sounds that are either really different in the two ears or they get smaller and more and more similar until we find what's called the sort of threshold for binaural listening. And I wanted to show you these data to highlight the importance of giving binaural hearing early on in life because there's an impact of deprivation. So these are data from adults who did this task. And lower numbers means good performance. <coughs> Normal hearing listeners would come in at about here. People who were deaf from very early on in life don't have any sensitivity to these cues even though we restore them as we present them to the cochlea with the processors. But people who had deprivation later on in life, some of these adults lost their hearing in their 20s and didn't start hearing again until their 50s, but you turn on the system and there it is, sitting there waiting to be activated. So there's a really important story. And our Studies with children show a similar vulnerability to deprivation early in life. Only the children who become deaf later have access to these cues, which is the motivation for building these engineering devices. So examples of some of our findings are the story about auditory plasticity being really important. And there's also an important aspect of the neural survival within the cochlea and understanding where in the cochlea we can best stimulate and there, I think, there are implications for stem cells and gene therapies in the inner ear, which we're discussing uh, pretty actively with colleagues as well. 
One uh, really fun clinical application is that we're partnering with uh, folks at UT Dallas who've built a device that instead of sitting at the desk in my lab, we will be able to send people out into sort of the real world to listen through these um, signal processing strategies that we're uh, trying to implement. This is one of our subjects who actually travels around the country to many labs to give us input. And here he's sitting in the cafeteria listening to background noise and saying, can I take these devices home with me because it, it sounds so great. So hopefully this is uh, the wave of the future and the next steps. Um, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about this other aspect of the research, which is the listening effort and the cognitive load that people report to us that they experience in uh, these complex listening situations. And they talk about how it's easier to hear with two ears than one. So our goal is to understand which of the signal processing strategies that we're using can actually be implemented for each patient to improve uh, speech localization and to release from cognitive load. So how are we doing this? We bring people into our soundproof booth and uh, use an eye tracker, uh, and in this case, not to look at eye gaze, but to measure the size of the pupil. And it turns out that pupillometry, which is a great field that's been around for decades, um, allows us an objective measure of arousal, which has been linked to listening effort and cognitive load in quite a few studies. And what we do in these studies is that we present people with um, sentences, and the idea is that when they're listening to sentences and exerting less effort, we predict that we'll see uh, less effort, whereas greater pupil dilation is reflective of more effort. And what they're doing when they're listening to sentences is they fixate on the computer screen, and we're measuring change in pupil dilation in real time. This is an example of some data that we collected as an initial proof of concept where we took speech sentences. We either presented normal sentences or we used computer simulations to degrade the signal to simulate what a cochlear implant would sound like. And these are the different conditions, normal all the way to 32 and 4 channels. And here's a change in uh, pupil dilation from baseline as a function of time. And what you could see is that in the normal condition, there's a little bit of a rise, but it's nowhere near as much as when we start to degrade the signal. So there's a really interesting effect of the speech resolution on listening effort. Notice, though, that they were always correct. They could tell us what the speech was, except that they had to work so much harder under degraded conditions. So following that proof of concept, we began to think about implementing this and looking at maybe uh, benefits of bilateral implantation. So I'm showing you just a little bit of data uh, from a work that's in progress. And I should point out that patients typically have either a poorer ear or a better ear, just because they typically have different kinds of hearing loss. Even after they get their implants, there are asymmetries. So here are data from a patient listening to only their poorer ear. You can see the pupil dilation change as a function of time. When we take that ear off and only put on the better ear, it's nice to see that there's a reduction. And they tell us, this is my better ear, and I'm working less hard with that one. The question is, what would happen when we turn on both ears? Would it be as bad as the poorer ear, or only as good as the better? Or, as it turns out, there's an integration and a facilitation when they have access to sound in both ears. And these are data from a group of 12 patients, and we're continuing to run these experiments to explore these issues further. But what we're learning is that bilateral listening modes seem to produce reduced listening effort compared to one ear alone. And often, it lines up really nicely with the patient's subjective report about which ear is better or worse. There are a few novel directions that our lab is moving in. Um, we're starting to look uh, also at aging populations to assess auditory function and cognition. This is really important as our population is aging and communication is a key component. And we fondly named this project the Golden Ears Project because we're studying people in their golden years. Um, we're also partnering with uh, colleagues who study patients who are at risk for developing Alzheimer's and dementia through the ADRC. These are patients who have biological uh, markers for risk, and there are really important questions here and implications for assessment, training, and uh, treatment. And another uh, novel direction 
As many of you know, we recently were able to um, purchase an FNIRS machine. This is a machine that allows us to do neuroimaging. Uh, it's a functional near-infrared spectroscopy, so unlike the magnetic imaging techniques, it's safe to use with cochlear implant patients. It's also cheaper and easier to use with many other patient populations. And in one of our recent studies that we uh, just submitted for publication with colleagues from Melbourne, uh, we described results on processing and speech and visual brain areas in deaf adults and looking at neural signatures of plasticity. So what, the question is whether we can use this kind of a technique to predict variability in the outcomes like what we've been seeing in our patients to do assessment and possibly help with treatment. And of course, related to the mission of the Weissman Center, can we extend these techniques to other populations with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, the work that I talked about today and future directions um, of the work also have translational areas. Um, we partner with uh, folks who work in industry, and I think that's a really important partnership, especially in the cochlear implant world and hearing aid world. We're really interested, ultimately, in improving assessment and treatment and engineering better devices. We're also really excited to partner uh, with healthcare professionals. We have uh, growing relationships with surgeons and audiologists and SLPs and educators. And finally, to me, uh, a huge part of our mission is education and outreach to work with patients and caregivers, providing information, doing advocacy, and integrating in the schools, in the workplace, social situations, and all the important things that people try to do in their daily life. So, that was my research presentation, um, and um, I really want to thank everyone in the lab, all of the past postdocs and uh, graduate students who've come through and are on uh, to their own careers, all of the amazing people uh, who are in the lab and our collaborators both on campus and around the world, and our sources of funding which have been really essential to helping with all of these missions in the basic science and the seed money that we've been able to receive uh, in the training opportunities for students in the lab. Um, so thank you uh, for listening to that part and huge thanks to everyone in the lab. These are pictures taken over the last couple of years because we can never get everybody in the same room. <laughs> but uh, really the work I talked about rests on the shoulders of everybody who's in the lab with the boots on the ground doing all this work. So thanks to you guys. Okay, so the next part of the presentation um, is to talk about a leadership vision for the Weissman Center. And um, I think it's important for all of us to uh, recognize and think about the fact that the Weissman Center is already currently a strong and a viable center that integrates uh, clinics and uh, daycare center research. Uh, we have core services in biomanufacturing. We do a lot of outreach. And, and we're already strong uh, because we have a very talented and invested community. And all the folks that come through our doors for months or years at a time and our stakeholders, the families and patients and community partners, as well as folks uh, that we're surrounded by that we work with and serve very closely. So I wanted to touch on a few points. You're probably wondering why I'm interested uh, in this position and uh, what are some of my thoughts about vision for future directions and impactful leadership. And um, if we have time, I'll talk about what might have prepared me for this position as well. So um, why am I interested in this directorship? I've been here for 17 years, was here for three years before then, and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. And I'm delighted uh, about the um, work that my lab has been able to do. But I think I'm ready to also give back in ways that uh, I haven't been able to uh, if I'm just in an investigator role. And I love mentoring and I love thinking about what other people are looking for and community building and looking for opportunities for future directions. I'm also concerned about changing relationships between the UW and state constituents. We are a quintessential example of the Wisconsin idea, but I don't think we put ourselves out there as much as we could and should. 
So um, I have huge motivation to serve the Weissman Center and the UW and the state at large uh, in that capacity. And I'm very motivated to work on sustainability and future opportunities that I'll talk about. I'm committed to this place as an IDD. This is an incredible center. And um, as you've heard me talk a little bit about during my research presentation, I'm very committed to blending basic science with translational research and also thinking about innovative uh, opportunities for therapies. We are in a very interesting funding climate and I think we have to put our heads together and put new hats on and thinking about funding opportunities uh, moving into the future. And I'm also, as many of you know, through some of the work that I do, I'm very committed to community building and to uh, sustaining and developing a climate that honors and integrates people with disabilities into our community. And what does it mean to build impactful leadership? So I believe that it's important to inspire and empower people to do the best that they can and to be their best selves and to support the careers of others, to lead by example, and to, not to overuse the term, but to really lean in and listen to understand what are the ideas of other people, embrace their suggestions and needs, and to also extend broadly to work with key stakeholders, creating a vision and sustainability. And I think that the communication strategy has to be transparent and open. Um, I also believe that because we have such a strong center, nothing's broken about it really. It's important to worry both about continuity and to integrate that with careful innovation. So we have to use strategic planning to continue to support our current mission and programs while pursuing new opportunities and innovative changes. I'd like to talk a little bit in more detail about some of the uh, innovations that I've been thinking about. So, some of the low-hanging fruit in terms of internal resources, I think, have to come through administrative support for certain things that many of us are trying to do but are spending a lot of our time doing, like streamlining uh, templates for IRBs, which are the bane of the existence of a lot of researchers. Um, I think we have to be much more proactive about professional development and mentoring networks for young investigators. And of course, I know we put in um, a cluster hire uh, initiative application, and I think thinking through that initiative and others is going to be uh, really important because we have this multidisciplinary expertise uh, in our midst. But there are lots of other funding opportunities that I think we need to think about and leverage. So extramurally, there are untapped government organizations that we need to uh, think about reaching out to. For example, the DOD, NASA, DARPA, we need to put in collaborative grants between the Weissman Center and other investigators on campus who we haven't engaged with yet. And of course there are the extramural opportunities through traditional agencies that are more within our comfort zone, but we have to respond to changing opportunities at NIH. For example, seeking paths um, to program projects that enhance and that leverage already intrinsic interdisciplinary relationships. And We've talked this morning in some of our meetings, and I believe very strongly in the fact that we have to embrace uh, clinical and translational grant mechanisms. And then think about, um, outside the box, about examples in European models uh, where there are sponsorships of PhD students and training opportunities for postdoctoral fellows, and really looking at those industrial partners um, in positive ways. I used to think that partnering with industry or government um, was sort of selling our soul to the devil, but I don't think about it that way at all. I think it's a really important part of our future direction. Of course, um, a huge part of what we have to do is philanthropic work. We're in a day and age where uh, the sustainability of our incoming uh, funding is, um, is, 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 put, is potentially going to be challenging. So I believe in strategizing around areas that are right for investment and thinking about potential growth and new opportunities. And, um, you know, UW Madison's investment in the Weissman Center needs to be part of that conversation. But um, as I participate in conversations uh, with other leaders around campus, and I listen to the chancellor talk about how she travels around the country with a new mission for uh, bringing funds to the UW, I can imagine a campaign like Forward with the Weissman Center in which we think very carefully about stakeholders both on campus and also thinking about how to 
deepen the pool and expand the pool of sponsors and philanthropists. I would love to build a stronger, more committed network of Weissman Center um, alumni to increase our web presence and social media um, and enhance that. And I think from talking to folks who work in development, it's important to get your boots on the ground and travel around the country and really meet with key stakeholders in thinking about these issues. So what would be great to be able to do through philanthropic and UW partners is to advance uh, initiatives such as worrying about our building. We have an aging building in the South Tower. And so as we think about what we can do uh, in the next decade or so, do we renovate? Do we reconfigure upcoming? Do, do we think about upcoming new directions in research and how to create spaces for those? And I love the idea that we would create open spaces, physically open spaces, that would then bring folks in for brainstorming and collaboration to talk to people you don't normally talk to who might be down the hall or one floor below you. And to create opportunities for things like chalk talks, but have these be inclusive discussions. The idea is that we would have intersectionality between scientists and clinicians and researchers who are working in different areas but would have potential for collaboration. And thinking about where the clinical issues fit in with all of our work. Now, in advancing some new initiatives for the Weissman Center, um, I think we have to invest in our future also by uh, doing some risk taking. And what that involves is coming up with uh, really uh, deep ways to offer seed and pilot money for new initiatives for seasoned and for new investigators, also for trainees, and to have a safety net and bridge funds so that we can retain critical staff and support gaps in grants. And I can't help but think about going back to the future, as it were, thinking about the continuity and enhancement of the vision uh, of Dr. Harry Weissman, who was himself a clinician scientist and thinking deeply about the training and integration with a larger number of departments and areas of research that are related to intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, I think recruiting more clinician scientists, MD researchers, and also MD, PhD investigators is part of responding to this growing need for clinicians who are trained in science to collaborate deeply with the School of Medicine and Public Health and other colleges in strategic hiring opportunities, and also to pursue training opportunities, engaging in discussions regarding mechanisms to protect research time for clinicians, because we know that that could be a really huge stumbling block for a lot of people. Um, during the years that I've been here, I've benefited from some opportunities uh, to travel abroad on sabbaticals, and those were really um, not just amazing for my own benefit in learning about how research is done at other places and building collaborations, but I felt that there were things that I could bring to those places as well through these interactions, and I would really love to see us think about a growing program in uh, having scholars in residence, people who come here and embed ourselves in our community, but also doing some exchanges. Uh, often you, uh, trainees are the folks who bridge uh, relationships between labs, but bringing in scholars of residence who can help us think outside the box, have exchanges and collaborations both nationally and internationally. So how do we uh, implement changes? What, what does change management look like? So I'm very process oriented. I think that what we have to do is define our mission. Why are we doing this? What are the objectives? What does success look like? We have to set goals, metrics, outcome measures. We have to be very strategic in thinking about how we get there. We have to have a plan. What are the most important projects? What are the low-hanging fruit? And what are some of the long-term goals? Engagement. Who will be involved? And finally, to me, a huge part of any strategic planning and change management is looking at accountability, how are we doing? Have we achieved the goals that we set out to achieve? I wanted to talk about a couple of examples. One, I've already talked about funding, uh, but focusing on resource stewardship, ensuring that resources are used effectively. And the other is an area that's very near and dear to my heart, which is diversity and inclusive excellence. How do we attract, develop, and retain underrepresented members of the Weissman Center community? Um, so beginning with diversity, 
as Brad mentioned in the introduction, I had the opportunity to be the faculty chair of uh, a pretty complex uh, group of people, 25 uh, committee members, um, faculty, staff, students, and community partners who did a lot of research and dug in very deeply to eventually write the campus's new plan for diversity and inclusive excellence. And we learned so much in that process. A lot of the process that we used is what I outlined in the last slide. Um, the first thing we, do, we did is um, to really think about how we define diversity, not only in the context of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomics, which are more traditional, but all the ways in which people bring themselves into this community. And the Weissman Center, of course, is a quintessential example of where we embrace diversity. And of course, disability is a huge part of our mission. So I believe that it's important to advance diversity not only because of the social justice argument that many of us leverage, but because it enhances education and training, because it enhances our global competence as we send our trainees into the world and as we become involved internationally, because it enhances our integrity and reputation, and because I think it leverages support from key stakeholders and potential sponsors. So how do we go about this? Well, um, I have a process that's sort of laid out here, but it includes the, the levels that I talked about earlier, which is that our goal is to have a diverse community to advance our mission in a number of areas. And particularly, this is an issue on campus that I would want to bring to the Weissman Center, which is ultimately we want to increase representation and participation of employees, students, faculty, and staff, patients, children in the WECP, members of the Board of Visitors, all of those are part of our community that we need to enhance and promote. And so we would go through these steps, which I think are really important. And similarly, in resource uh, stewardship, our goal would be to define and think about the continued growth of fundraising and support, and how do we go about doing that in terms of setting our objectives and goals to get a new influx of funds and look at new mechanisms to work with our current network and engage other units. And eventually, this is an iterative process that I think ultimately boils down to accountability. So I have a few minutes left, and I thought I would just talk a little bit about what might have prepared me for a position. So here are some examples of experiences uh, that I've had here. In my department, um, I've had opportunities to do things like conducting our self-study, which involves redirection of programming and funding. We had to renegotiate with UW system and the college and think about central campus stakeholders. It was a complicated, intricate, at times painful process, but ultimately led to a good solution. And uh, I see some colleagues here from otolaryngology, and uh, within the Department of Surgery Division of Otolaryngology, we've undergone a really tremendous process recently uh, in terms of novel directions in uh, clinical research, and it's been a really interesting process that I think is leading to uh, great new directions. Um, I've been involved at, at the level of the college and the university um, in a number of areas that have led to some pretty deep sort of leaning in and thinking about strate strategic planning and partnering with a lot of stakeholders on and off campus, the Board of Regents and um, state constituents. Um, for example, uh, chairing the Diversity Planning Committee, which I mentioned, chairing the Committee on Women, where we uh, made the campus aware of the fact that there's no, there hadn't been uh, a policy for leave after birth or adoption of a child, which shocked everybody, but it was true. And we worked really hard with uh, deans and representatives from many colleges, alerting them to the situation, and then really trying to push forward with having uh, policy implemented. And it's starting to come together, although it's, it's been a long process. And I've been on a number of elected committees, which gives me insight into how this place works and how to help to promote uh, and support the work of others. And I'm in, very involved nationally, internationally, in a number of professional organizations and chairing program committees for thousands of people who have input and ideas and you know, trying to sort of streamline change uh, while listening to what everybody has to say. And those have been fun, interesting, and challenging as well. 
Um, so um, my background really in human development, neuroscience, age span research, basic and translational research, I think is key to being able to understand what are some of the things that go on here to support the work of others and directing an interdisciplinary lab thinking about creative uh, budget string opportunities. And I also uh, love outreach work. Um, so we created here a day with experts on cochlear implants, which happens once a year, and we bring together uh, patients from the community who want to learn from clinicians and researchers and build community and understand what are some of the issues that they're facing and are other people facing the same things. A number of years ago, I organized a an outreach educational program in Fox Valley Community College after talking with representatives from the Board of Visitors who really wanted us to go out to the state and do these uh, sort of activities, and I would love to do more of those. And um, I've been involved in the City of Madison with engagement, um, and also uh, for about eight or nine years, we've been hosting this incredible conference here that brings folks uh, sort of out of the woodworks and from all over the country to dig deeply and have really safe space for conversations about what their research is and be able to put themselves out with new and crazy ideas, but get really constructive feedback and, and build community in novel ways. And I, I'd love to think about how to bring that to other fields as well. And I do a lot of mentoring workshops around the country for trainees and junior faculty. And I've also been involved in the MCH LEND program um, as a faculty member. So these sort of give me insights into some of the work that we need to do and um, how to move forward. Um, and so, I've also had broad experience um, with campus-wide initiatives, for example, working on the strategic planning uh, and new HR redesign. And we had to work really closely with members of uh, the OHRD. So these are folks who really help you dig in, know how to have conversations, know how to bring folks together and come up with new missions. We now have really interesting uh, new directions that really aim to improve climate and civility on campus. And I'm one of the liaisons uh, that really work closely with people on the hostile and intimidating behavior, how to not uh, have hostile and intimidating <laughs> behavior on campus, <laughs> and how to be a resource uh, to units and departments. We're going to launch that in the next few months. Um, and uh, you know, through my work with faculty governments, I understand a little bit about how we formed the office of the VCRGE and how we're moving forward and uh, how we go about implementing change in terms of policies and procedures and budgets and things like that. Um, so I've said enough, and uh, I'm sure you have some questions for me, so I would love to uh, take questions now. Thanks so much for your attention. If, if I could just briefly, I'll let Ruth command the, the question and answer session, but I see people leaving. On um, there's these white pieces of paper, and on them are uh, links for the survey uh, where you can give your, your, your thoughts and impressions. Please, please, please um, go to this website afterwards and provide your comments. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. So um, I imagine that there's other um, people who have the uh, equivalent position of the Wasteman Director across campus. How would you reach out to those other groups and share best practices and kind of build some collaborations that then can be brought into um, the innovations that you're interested in? I'm really glad you asked that question because I think that would be part of what I would do even in the first few months on the job. Uh, there's a new director, for example, at WID, who I think is bringing some innovative ideas to campus. And as you said, there are a number of centers around campus that sort of operate in the same way that we do. And so um, I would really love to engage with those directors and to understand what are some of the challenges that they have faced and uh, how they implemented change in a way that was good for everybody. I would like to educate myself about the processes that they followed and also what are some of the challenges they have in engaging with campus to leverage resources because that's always a, a tight rope to walk and we're both uh, asking for support and having to prove who we are so how do you sort of have those conversations 
in a healthy and productive manner. I would love to build a sort of network of directors that sort of communicate on a regular basis around issues that we're all worried about on an ongoing basis. And some of those conversations are happening already, but I think it would be good to innovate uh, some of those conversations as well. Thank you. So the diversity question, Ruth. Uh, uh, a recent survey indicated that about 7% of UW-Madison faculty identify as having a disability. And, and you think those kind of faculty and investigators might be concentrated in a place like the Weissman Center, but I'm not sure that they really are. Uh, do you have any comments on that aspect of our diversity or, mm -hmm. or lack of diversity within the within the uh, group of, of uh, PIs? Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. So I've actually engaged with some of uh, those colleagues over the years. Um, and I think that a lot of them are not working on research areas necessarily that are related to the mission of the Weissman Center. I think that if they are working on areas that are related, then I think we have to be very proactive in engaging them and asking if they would like to be part of our community. The issue with diversity and disability and diversity with race and ethnicity I think is also important in the context of folks who don't like to be sort of the poster child. You know, if I'm the only person from a minority background and you want to use me as your quintessential example, I don't think I want to be that. So it's about building community, not bringing one or two people, but actually creating a space where a community of people who uh, feel that they see other people who are like themselves, but also can be part of the broader community, um, I think it would be uh, better for everybody to engage at that level. But I would need to learn more and understand about who is out there, who's not part of us, and, and why, if they could have made that choice, they haven't. I guess it's a choice we make in every lab, right? Yes. I mean, there are people with cochlear implants working Correct. on the research team, and are there people with, yeah, you know, we could ask the same question if you're very loud. I think we should. I would really like to urge, whether I become the director or not, I would like to urge all of our units to think very carefully about how we recruit, create space, go out of our way, maybe give up something that would otherwise cost us more money in order to diversify our workforce and our trainees. Uh, I think we have, we have to be the model for how this work is done, and I think we could be better at that. I'm really glad you raised that issue. Right. So this is a question that is unanswerable, but... <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> well, no, 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 I don't mean it that way, because I think of it. So what is your 90-day plan? Right, so, and I don't think anything really can ever happen in 90 days, but I'm kind of asking what you think really. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I don't think I <laughs> I didn't plan you either. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, um, Sorry. I think this is a wonderful question. I, I began to think about what my first few months on the job would look like, because I can't just sit back and do the same old, same old. So I think um, I would really like to think about what does it mean to redirect priorities in terms of uh, reducing some of our current efforts you know, outside of the Weissman Center? Is that something uh, that is important to us? But the most important thing to me is information gathering. I want to visit every lab. I want to visit every clinic. I want to walk through the Weissman uh, Early Childhood Program with Joan. And I haven't been there probably in about 10 years. And, know what it looks like and what it feels like. Um, I want to meet with trainees and grad students and postdocs who are not in my area. I want to understand what the clinicians are doing and what they're interested in and what it would take to build a, a stronger intersection between the uh, clinic and the research. I want to understand who's struggling with what and what we can ultimately do to help them. So information gathering is really important to me. Visiting each unit so that I can understand the factors that contribute to the ongoing success and also issues that can be addressed and what may be the order of priority. Once that's done, and it might take you know, a good couple of months of digging in, I would like to think about it also enlarging uh, our circle in terms of stakeholders around UW. Think about directors of sister centers and what they're dealing with because we're one of a group of centers around the country. 
and I haven't had a chance to get to know those directors, but I would like to visit some of those and talk to directors of centers and understand what they're doing. Um, and then think about, um, you know, what I, I need to get more deeply rooted into IDD centers and NICHD because I've been really deeply rooted in NIDCD, which is the National Institute for Deafness and Communicative Disorders, but we're funded uh, in large part by the National Institute for Child um, Development. So I need to get more embedded into that organization and understand uh, what it takes for uh, new director to be successful in those arenas. Maybe it will take more than two months, but... <laughs> yeah, thank you. I have a question that kind of builds on that. Um, because we are a center that includes the use of the IDRC and the LEND programs, and, and you know, some of what you're doing there could help, but um, what are your ideas for integrating activities that are common goals for all three of those programs, specifically like training or research or dissemination of those space practices. Did everybody hear the question about uh, integrating uh, the various components of the Weissman Center? Um, so and I agree 100% that actually we need uh, to do more of that because we're very, very strong in each of our areas. And in an ideal world, we would be much more integrated. So how do you go about doing that? So I think the first step is to find out who is here who would like to be involved and more integrated. You know, which researcher is actually thinking about the fact that they would like to be more integrated with the clinics and clinical research, but hasn't had a foot in the door? And which of the clinicians are really interested in becoming more involved in research? I think by leveraging um, existing interests, we would start to build a network. Um, I mentioned earlier this idea of uh, creating open spaces. And I think that what would be wonderful to see is either use of existing spaces or down the road some renovations, but um, creating opportunities for people to walk in the door and feel that there are conversations going around that they want to join to learn about what other people are doing, and then to kind of take that forward to engage and to think about how to plan uh, for the future. Um, I also know that junior investigators often want to be involved in this, but they're really trying to get tenure. And so how do you go about doing that? Well, I think senior investigators who are interested and involved can help to shepherd those processes through. And I think that a lot of the work that we could do in that area can bubble up from conversations about what people think is possible. We have so many wonderful leaders and thoughtful people here who I think would engage and dig deeply into thinking about how to move that forward. So I wouldn't just come in and say this is what we're doing. I think we would use engagement processes to think about how to move forward, but it's a huge priority. Uh, how would you approach the task of balancing your obligations as a mentor to the people in your lab so taking on the duties of being directed? Nice. <laughs> I love that question because my husband asks me that every day. <laughs> um, so I actually, before applying for this position, I sat down and I actually counted how many hours a week I spend doing certain things, including uh, commitments to teaching, commitments uh, to my department, commitments to certain organizations, and a lot of shared governance work on campus. And I came up with a very large number of hours that I won't share with you. And I realized that I, can, I have been doing all of those things on top of maintaining a very active lab. Um, and so I think that my first priority would be to peel back, which I would be expected to do anyway, but really peel back and open up time and space uh, to take on this kind of a role uh, with, with full force. And, and I think that the role demands that you continue to run an active lab. So it's really about time management. Maybe a little bit related, but, but about time to development. Yeah, I, I've been surprised in talking with uh, deans, for instance, about the percentage of time they devote to development fundraising ideas. Even as a department chair myself, uh, a little time this morning on development, some time yesterday on development, some time over the weekend on development. Right. Right. <laughs> kind of, uh, what would be your vision? Would you be devoting 
10% retired to development, 30% uh, retiring? Uh, what, what, what do you think? So it's a great question because I think that if development is going to be innov in innovative and it's going to lead us to some new directions, in the beginning it would take more time. But like every project that I get involved with, um, research, new research directions in my lab and, and, and other new projects, I put in a huge amount of time in the beginning to make sure that, it's in, that the project is in good place. But I think we would need to have professional development folks and we would need to get other folks involved who are interested in development. So I think in the beginning it would take up more of my time to learn about what's there, what opportunities are there, who are the key stakeholders, and help to build the infrastructure and the paths to success and then trim back my time as I see that I can let that go a little bit, but always continue to stay involved. I don't know what percent of time it would, what it would look like. I think it would ebb and flow depending on sort of what's coming uh, up the pipeline. Questions? <coughs> there are no bad questions. Yeah, so what does mentoring look like? Um, so I think that mentoring has to happen at all stages of development. And I think that for uh, trainees, so students and young investigators, training is really about uh, building uh, capacity, understanding what they're dealing with, dealing with um, sort of their own uh, work-life balance and strategizing um, around um, how to leverage resources and how to get help not too much help, but enough help, right? Uh, how to write grants. Um, there are many, many, many areas uh, that I think in, would involve workshops. I think it would involve bringing in uh, folks uh, from on and off campus. It would involve reading uh, groups and um, journal clubs and uh, really kind of dealing with both professional and personal issues uh, in terms of uh, mentoring. Then there's a level of mentoring as people get a little bit more senior and mid-career and kind of say, uh-oh, what am I doing next? And I've seen a lot of that. And in conversations around campus and all sorts of groups of you know, scientists and, and uh, clinicians, there's a question of what do I do next and how do I move forward? And sometimes people get stuck after they get tenure or after that next project is done. And there's nothing that's going on right now. And I've been really amazed at the number of people who are clamoring for, for those sort of conversations, workshops. A lot of it is very informal, and yet when you create a space and offer food and start the conversation, people come and they participate, and then they build community and they help each other. And it, and it could be really sustainable in long term. Um, and then I think there are issues for senior investigators as well. What do I do when I'm in my 50s and 60s? And, I'm still interested, but you know, some ideas are running dry. How can I redirect? Where can I go next? Um, and I think for clinicians who are thinking about how to broaden their interest and how to get involved or re-involved, there are many, many, I think pretty much everybody could, could look for uh, opportunities for professional development and gain by learning and also by giving and, and engaging more people in those opportunities in both directions would be great. Any more questions? Well, we still have a little time, so let me ask. <laughs> um, you know, I think if we all look around the room here, almost everyone here, I would assume, belongs to the Wiseman Center, one lab or another, and I think there's probably everybody would say there's a lot of unfamiliar faces. Um, so once again, it goes on to the director and the role they might play. Often we talk about the big picture things, but uh, with directors so often it's just the little things that, that help people um, get to know each other and collaborate. And what do you think we do here at the Wiseman that really works? Some of the little things that are, that are real good, mm -hmm. maybe some that you've seen in other labs <coughs> that really help um, bring people together and exchange for different ideas. Mm -hmm. 
So what I think that works around here is that we have a community of really dedicated people, um, but we have a climate. There's an assumption that when you walk in the door, you behave well, and people treat each other well, people are respectful, and, and they listen to one another, and they have a certain sensibility. I think that by engaging with the Weissman Center, people already bring to the doorstep a certain uh, engagement and sensibility about life and, and, and what's important in life. We have so many interesting ways in which people engage here. So um, anywhere from the academic scenes where we have journal clubs to the uh, open format uh, sessions in which people come to learn from one another about science um, to the way in which you can actually walk around and say hello to people and engage with people to the um, Wednesday mornings I hail and farewell to the poster sessions. So I think we have some of these opportunities where really anyone can come in and go up to anybody and just start talking to them. Um, do I want to see more of those? I think yes. I think that there could be many more of those because so many of us don't know each other and don't have those opportunities to engage. And I think that by becoming friendly and deeply rooted with, in relationships with other people, it can lead to the integration of ideas and collaboration it can lead to collaboration between clinicians and scientists, between students from some groups who are all of a sudden engaging with folks from other groups. Uh, but what I think makes the Weissman Center work is the people who are here and their commitment and dedication to the incredible mission of this place. Not to sound too idealistic or positive, but <laughs> I really think so many things here work well and there's an expectation of, of how we treat one another. Yes. What is your vision for the integration of self-advocates and family members of people with IBD? So, um, I think that there are a number of ways in which integration can take place. Um, a starting point is the Weissman Center Day with Experts, in which families or patients come in through the door and engage with one another and learn about what we offer here, learn about clinical opportunities and learn about best practices. I think that what we would what would be really great to do is to sort of extend those programs and to grow them. So for example, in the afternoon to have a more interactive sort of opportunity for families families and self advocates to communicate and to build networks and to then continue those throughout the year. So I'd love to see not one-time events, but sort of continuity of the thread of the ideas that emerge during those sort of opportunities. And there are other opportunities that we can create. Um, I would love to hear what other people have to say and what ideas people have that could help grow that mission. I think it's a really important mission. So thanks for that question. I really appreciate it. Well, if there's no other questions, um, let's thank, thank you. Ruth again. Thank you.